In this video, we will start examining fluid dynamics in a rotating frame of reference. We do this so as to better understand the large-scale geophysical flows of the atmosphere and ocean, which we experience in the rotating reference frame that is provided by Earth. We begin by performing a reference frame transformation. Up to now, the focus of the course has been on understanding fluid flows in an inertial reference frame, where fluid motions are driven by pressure gradients and gravity. You have seen the continuity equation for incompressible fluids, the Navier-Stokes momentum equation, which for in viscid flow reduces to Euler's equations in three directions, where the horizontal accelerations are simply functions of the respective pressure gradients, and the vertical equation maintains a gravitational component. These equations are in an inertial reference frame, meaning the reference frame is homogeneous, isotropic, and time independent. Now, planets rotate and thus do not provide an inertial reference frame. So far, we have been able to overlook the fact that Earth is rotating, because the flows that we have been interested in have time scales much smaller than the planetary rotation time scale. It is not always the case that background rotation can be ignored. For instance, if we want to understand the dynamics of the bands on Jupiter, or those governing destructive weather events like Cyclone Winston, we need to account for the effects of planetary rotation. To describe these flows with sensible equations, we need to first perform a bit of vector calculus to recast the equations of fluid motion into a rotating frame of reference. Consider a vector x in a fixed frame of reference, Rf, with some arbitrary origin, O. This origin can be arbitrary because Rf is an inertial frame of reference. Now consider a second frame of reference. This one is rotating about some axis that coincides with our arbitrarily located origin O. The rotation rate about this axis is omega. Now the vector x is composed of two vectors relevant to this new frame of reference. x is composed of an along axis component z and an off axis component r, which is also the radial distance from the axis of rotation. This decomposition of x into its along axis and off axis terms introduces a new vector cross product, omega cross x, which is orthogonal to both the radius r and the axis of rotation omega. To relate the two frames of reference, one fixed and one rotating, it is best to consider their movement relative to each other. For a vector x, this becomes two velocities. The rate of change of x in the fixed frame, uf, and in the rotating frame, ur. So that for any vector x, the transform between the fixed and rotating frames is given in terms of this vector cross product, omega cross x, and the rates of change of x in the two reference frames. Remember that one frame is moving relative to the other, so that these velocities cannot be identically zero simultaneously except in the case of the null solutions where omega or x are zero. For fluids, we are interested in accelerations, so let's perform this transform on the vector describing the fluid velocity in the fixed frame, uf. We know that uf is related to the velocity in the rotating frame, ur, by this equation, so we can make the substitution for uf on the right hand side in terms of derivatives in the rotating frame, giving us the velocity in the rotating frame plus the term omega cross x. We separate this out to get the acceleration in the rotating frame, the rate of change of omega cross x in the rotating frame, the cross product of omega and the velocity in the rotating frame, and this triple vector cross product omega cross omega cross x. Now omega is time invariant, meaning the time derivative here only applies to x, giving a second omega cross ur term. Let's pause here for a moment. We have the acceleration in the fixed frame of reference equal to the acceleration in the rotating frame plus two additional terms. 2 omega cross ur, which is called the Coriolis term, and this triple vector cross product omega cross omega cross x, called the centripetal term. At this stage, we substitute this transform back into the Navier-Stokes momentum equation for a fixed frame. 
giving the total time derivative in the rotating frame plus the Coriolis and centripetal terms as equal to the gravity, pressure gradients and viscosity terms. Let's first look at the centripetal term. From vector calculus relations, a triple vector cross product can be expanded like so, giving the difference of two dot products. For the centripetal term, this becomes omega outside of omega dot x minus x outside of omega dot omega. Next, we substitute the along axis z and off axis r components for x. Now r and omega are orthogonal, so their dot product is zero. Z and omega are in the same direction, so the omega omega z here is cancelled by the z omega omega here, leaving just the radial component and omega squared. We can take this one step further and express it as a gradient of a potential in R. We do so by integrating in R, getting omega cross omega cross x as equal to the negative of the divergence in the radius squared by omega squared over 2. As a potential, this centripetal term can now be combined with the gravity term to define a geopotential term, phi, where phi g is the gravitational potential. This geopotential can be thought of as g star, the gravity corrected for centripetal accelerations. We substitute this g star back into the Navier-Stokes equation to recast the momentum equations in terms of the centripetal corrected gravity. The next term to examine is the Coriolis term, 2 omega cross u. It is best to understand Coriolis in terms of the local rotating coordinate frame on Earth's surface, where you are some angle theta from the equator. The x direction is east-west, y is north-south, and z is locally vertical away from the center of Earth. Consider the rotation vector omega at this point. In these coordinates, omega is sine with latitude in the vertical, cosine with latitude in the y, the north-south, and it has no x, or east-west, component. Taking some velocity, u, v, w, at this point, 2 omega cross u approximates to negative 2 omega v sine latitude in the x, 2 omega u sine latitude in the y, and zero in the z. This is approximate because we have ignored the vertical component of the Coriolis force because it is much much smaller than gravity. This is normally written as negative fv in the x, fu in the y, where f equals 2 omega sine latitude is referred to as the Coriolis parameter. What is interesting to note here is that the east-west component of the Coriolis force depends on the north-south velocity. Likewise, the north-south component depends on the east-west velocity. Also, the Coriolis force is a function of sinusoid of latitude, meaning it changes sine across the equator. This leads to atmospheric storms, ocean gyres, and many other interesting flow features rotating in opposite directions for the north and south hemispheres. Bringing the Coriolis and geopotential terms together into the Navier-Stokes equation gives us the momentum equation for flow on a rotating planet. We'll finish with a question. What is the difference in distance between the center of Earth and the geopotential surface at the pole and at the equator?